It's 8.15 a.m. And that puts me behind the wheel at the tail end of my morning routine of getting two daughters out the door and dropped off at school. Now, it has already taken tremendous reservoirs of patience, strength, and endurance to get to this point, right? To drag brushes through tangles of hair, to make sure that the right shoes have been put on the right feet, uh, to make sure that all underwear and tights have been put on right side out and under the aforementioned shoes, right? And that's just to get myself dressed. I have to get the kids ready now, too. <laughs> and so we're in the car, and the last remaining obstacle of our morning mission is the rotary. Maybe you know it as a traffic circle or a roundabout, or perhaps if you're also three years old, the round and round. And as we get close to the round and round, my daughters and I engage in our daily activity of counting the cars in front of us in line. But on this day, the countdown stalls at three, and a voice from the back seat says, Daddy, you know, why did we stop? And I explain, well, honey, the guy in the red car in front of our line isn't moving right now. You know, that happens sometimes at the rotary. And so I gave Red Nissan a reasonable amount of time to get his affairs in order. About eight seconds, right? I think that's what you get at the Rotary, about eight seconds to wait for an opening before you have to take matters into your own hands and lead the troops into battle, right? And we all know the signs say state law, drivers yield to Rotary traffic, but we know there's a little bit of wiggle room there, right? We've learned that those words are to be taken about as literally as warnings regarding mattress tags and key duplication. And so I was not the only person honking. Okay, I may have been the first, but I was not the only person honking. Quite quickly, however, there's a cacophony of car horns. And again, a little voice in the back seat saying, Daddy, what's going on? What's all that noise? And I said, well, honey, red Nissan here needs to learn how to drive. <laughs> and she asks, you mean he didn't go to preschool when he was little? <laughs> right, very cute. To which I respond, I'm sure his dad didn't drive fast enough to get him to preschool on time, sweetie. <laughs> Finally, after two minutes that seemed like 20, we ease into the rotary, and honestly, I'm sort of distressed and agitated with Red Nissan at this point, and I don't hear my daughter's next question, so she asks again, and she says, Daddy, why were all the cars coming out of the round and round? Why did they have flags on them? So I didn't say anything. She says, Daddy, all the cars coming out of the round and round had little blue flags on them, and their lights are on, but it's not nighttime. My response, I believe, was, ugh. As I slumped down in the seat and explained, um, yeah, that's called a funeral procession, honey. You have to wait quietly and patiently and respectfully for those to go by. Um, there's a moral to my story today, a moral that transcends the twofold conclusion that I am an impatient driver and an apparently lousy role model for my children. <laughs> and the moral to the story is that situations matter, that context has a dramatic influence on how we think, how we act, who we are as people, but we don't notice it. We're often blind to that power of context, much like the hypothetical driver at the hypothetical rotary who doesn't notice the hypothetical funeral procession going by. We don't take stock of the entirety of the situations in which we find ourselves. And what I'm here to suggest to you today is that we have to, and that if we start to attend to the ways in which context shape who we are as people, we become more effective people, we become more engaged members of our community, and we can help build the kinds of communities that we want to live in. So as we talk about sustainable and engaged communities, we need to understand the obstacles that are in our way to getting there and what we can do to try to surmount those. So what do I mean by this hidden power of context? Well, consider, for example, what it takes to jolt you out of routine, to make you really fully attentive of what's going on around you, like traveling abroad. Right? When you take a trip abroad and you become a tourist, you suddenly start to pick up on all of these it hits you over the face, the unwritten rules, the customs, the expectations, the road signs, the things that make no sense to you, right? As a South African, you see the sign, you realize it means no roadside vendors. As an American tourist, you see the sign, you say, okay, don't stack up your cannonballs under the pretty parasol, <laughs> right? And then you get back home and you realize that there are all of these unwritten rules and expectations that govern life at home when we don't pay attention to them either. Or think about your childhood home. Right? I recall the first time I visited my childhood home as, as a visitor. Freshman year of college, Thanksgiving break, you walk in and within a few moments, it's become clear that you know, this place has a smell to it. It has sounds to it. Like every other building that I've ever been in in my life, but I never noticed them when I was living here, when I was so fully ensconced in that actual situation. Cognitive psychologists, cognitive scientists talk about this with, with regard to the mind and learning as well. It's called state-dependent learning. 
The idea is that if you find yourself in an area where you are studying a list of words or a, a set of material, and there's a certain cue in that environment, let's say the odor of chocolate is piped into that room. Well, when you take the test on that material, if that odor of chocolate is present there again, you'll do better on the test. You'll remember more words. Our minds work this way as well. And it goes like this with people, too, with the ways that we think about each other and interact with other people in our daily lives. So I actually need your help with something. I'm going to bequeath to you 10 very valuable seconds of my time here, and I want you to think about a trivia question. Okay, a good trivia question on any topic. You just have to know the right answer to it. It has to be a good question you could use to stump someone else in this room, the other smart people in this room. So 10 seconds, take it and think of a good trivia question. Okay, now I'm gonna let you off the hook. I'm gonna make it clear to you, you don't have to ask other people these questions. You can relax and just listen to what's about to follow. But let's say we had more time together. And instead of 10 seconds to think of one question, I give you 10 minutes to think of 10. And then let's say I put all of your names into a hat, and I pick two of them out of that hat, and at random, two people from this audience had to come join me up on this stage, and at that point, I flipped a coin. And that coin holds the fate of those two people standing in front of you. Right, depending on how that coin comes up, one of these individuals is going to have to stand over here, on this side of the stage, to my right, to your left, and is going to be the, the questioner. The, the quiz show host of my little quiz show demonstration is going to read out loud the 10 questions he or she came up with. And that coin flip is going to send someone else to the less desirable other side of the stage, where they are going to stand here and answer those questions in front of everyone, in front of this entire audience, right? Recorded by these cameras for all perpetuity, or at least as long as the, the links to YouTube remain unbroken. And they're going to have to stand here and answer those questions on the hot lights and, and respond to what's asked of them in front of this audience. Well, researchers actually did this study several years ago. They brought at random people up and assigned them to the roles of quiz show questioners and quiz show answerers. Now, there are 10 questions. So the average respondent, they ran the study at Stanford University. These are smart kids. The average respondent out of 10 questions, the average contestant on this side of the stage gets four questions right. Doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a really hard task when you think about it, right? To subject yourself to the idiosyncratic knowledge base of another smart person. I, I do a variation of the study in my classes at Tufts, and here's an example of the kinds of questions you get. Number one, name all five members of NSYNC. Number two, who was the only president to serve on the Supreme Court. And number three, name all five members of the Backstreet Boys. <laughs> this is the impressive, eclectic mix of information you get from a liberal arts education. And maybe this combination of judicial political history and pop music boy bands is right up your intellectual alley, right? For most of us, though, at least one of those avenues, if not both, that's going to be challenging. And that's why people only get four right. But that's not the interesting part of this study. The more interesting part of the study is what happens with everyone else, the audience who's watching. Because the researchers then say to the audience members, OK, we want you to tell us what you think of these two individuals on the stage. Specifically, on a scale of 1 to 100, rate the level of general knowledge possessed by these two people, the quiz show questioner and the quiz show answerer, the contestant and the host. Mind you, everyone there knows exactly what you know. They know that these people were picked at random. They know that it was a coin flip that determined who would stand over here and ask questions and get to show off his or her knowledge base and never be put under the gun of having to answer questions. And they know the coin flip puts someone on the other side of the stage to answer questions and to never have the opportunity to show off what he or she knows about a variety of different topics. Knowing all that, still, here's what the data look like. The average rating for the host, 82. The average rating for the contestant, 47. Okay. People think that the quiz show questioner possesses a broader range of information. Essentially, they, they, they think he or she is the smarter one, just based on what they saw. What they're doing is they're looking past context. They're, avoiding, they're ignoring the situation that has set these people up here, and they're making conclusions about internal explanations for their behavior. That's what we do. Our default tendency as people is to see each other in terms of personality type or consistent character, stable predisposition, to come up with internal explanations for the behaviors of people around us as opposed to attending to the, the entirety of the situation around us, much like the driver at the rotary in the funeral procession, right? Not, not attending to the situational factors that change who we are and how we think. One more example of what I mean by this power of context. Think about what you do when you hear the news story about the tourist who's visiting New York and passes out on the subway. 
hours going by before anyone notices or intervenes in any way. And our knee-jerk response is to indict everyone on that train, or perhaps city dwellers everywhere as being unusually callous people, dispositionally indifferent to the plight of their fellow human beings. I'm going to suggest that that's the easy way out. That's the cop-out explanation. Right? To think about bad behavior as being bad apples responsible for it is oddly reassuring. It imposes order into our unpredictable world. It reassures us that I would never do this, or people in my neighborhood would never act this way. This could never happen in my community. But what we do is we overlook the ways in which ordinary situations make all of us, yes, you and me included, less likely to get involved in the affairs of other people. And that's what I want to spend the rest of my time talking about. It's an obstacle to our engagement with our community around us, a variety of situational factors. And one of them, as it is on the subway, is being in a crowd, being in a group of people, being surrounded by others. Ironically, being surrounded by others makes us less likely to get engaged in the communities in which we find ourselves, less likely to involve ourselves in what's going on around us. I'm going to give you three specific reasons why that's the case. Number one. When we're in a group, when we're in a crowd, we just don't notice what's going on around us. We don't attend to things quite as clearly. We, it's a complicated and complex world out there that bombards us with a variety of stimuli. And what we do cognitively is we put on these perceptual blinders. You put your head down and walk quickly to get to the T. You keep your head down and your headphones on when you're on the T. On a crowded city street, in a crowded subway car, or when you're surrounded by others, you've got a lot going on and you focus on the task at hand to get done what you want to get done. It's part of what helps us accomplish tasks on a day-to-day -day basis, but it also leaves us less aware of what's going on around us, again, like me in the morning commute at the Rotary. We don't notice what's happening around us when we're with a large group of people. Number two, even if we do notice what's going on, even if we do notice in the hubbub of the subway car that someone has slumped over, when we're in a group of people, when we're in a crowd, we're not as likely to interpret what's happening as in need of our intervention or anyone's intervention. Think about the subway example. You get on the subway car. You notice there's a guy slumped over. You look around. No one else seems concerned. They're going about their business as usual. You assume they must know something you don't know. Maybe they were just talking to the guy five minutes ago, and he said, hey, you know what, I'm going to take a nap. And he's a heavy sleeper, apparently. Or they're on the train with him every morning, and he does this on a, on a regular basis. You assume they know something you don't know, and therefore you don't get involved. And this cycle, this, this inertia of an action continues as the new train passengers get on, look to you for information, and you don't do anything. So it goes in an emergency, but so it goes with the, the larger scale issues that confront us as a neighborhood, as a community, as a society. We look around, and when no one else seems concerned or alarmed, we assume everything must be OK, and we don't take action. And number three, even if we notice what's happening, we interpret it as something that needs intervention. When you're in a group of people, you let that responsibility diffuse to others, right? You're just not likely to step up and say, I'm the one who's going to handle this because you assume someone else will take care of this. And you do this every week at your office when you get that mass email and you assume, well, there's 40 names on this distribution list. I'm not going to be the one to respond to this. Or you do this at the movies when the film goes out of focus and you say, well, someone's got to go tell the projectionist about this, but it sure as hell ain't going to be me. Right, we do this for low-level events, we also do this for big-picture issues, for emergencies and for the, the major issues that confront us as, as a society, as a community. In fact, this tendency to be less engaged, to get less involved in what's going on around us and with others around us when we're in a group, when we're in a crowd, so deeply ingrained that simply visualizing being in a group is enough to make us less engaged. So if you have people in a research study, think about being in a crowded movie theater or going out to a restaurant with a large group of people, and then right afterwards you hit them up for something, a donation to charity, would you be willing to support the following cause or donate some time to it? We're less generous subsequently to having just thought about ourselves in a crowd. So you think about a crowd, it actually makes you less involved, less engaged. And so what I want to leave you with are what are some specific ways to try to surmount this obstacle, to try to capitalize on, take advantage of this situational force that drives us towards not being engaged towards apathy in some respects, and make us more engaged citizens, make other people around us more engaged members of our community. And I'm going to give you three specific suggestions here, too. So number one, take off the blinders. Literally, right? Take off the headphones sometimes on the T. Talk to the people waiting next to you in line. Introduce yourself to the people you're sitting next to today or your neighbors, because once you know the names of those people around you and they cease to be strangers, suddenly they're acquaintances and a lot of these processes are less likely to happen. But beyond this, think about it from a marketing standpoint. 
If there's an issue in your community that you need people's attention to, that you want to attract folks' efforts and money and resources to, you need to do some hand-waving. You need to get their attention and flag it down and point it in the direction that you want. Because not everyone is noticing the things that you're noticing that seem so obvious to you. Number two, don't assume everything is okay. I'm not calling for a chicken little like attitude or philosophy. The sky is always falling. You should be pessimist and alarmist. But what I suggest is that you need to look into things and not rest on the assumption that I'm sure everything's fine because no one else has worked up about it. Every once in a while, on that Friday night at 2 a.m., when you hear the screams outside your apartment or your house and you assume that's people having a little bit too much fun, a little bit too loud, a little bit too late at night, poke your head out the window and make sure. Right? When, you, when you are uh, you know, at the playground and the 10-year-old big kid is at the top of the climbing structure and getting ready to jump like he's some sort of superhero and you say, well, maybe his parents are okay with this or maybe he does have superpowers. I'd like to see how this winds up. Maybe this is just natural selection and action. Maybe say something. Right? Maybe get involved and actually say something. And for that matter, think at a, at a more general level when it comes to ideas. Don't rest on the assumption that if there's a better way to get this done, someone else already would have thought of it. Right? Because then innovation never happens. If we defer to the idea that, that everyone else knows something that we don't, nothing ever improves, nothing ever gets done. And number three, stop diffusion of responsibility. Right? Take action. Be the one who tells the projectionist that the film is out of focus. Be the one who drives by the stoplight and calls the police and say, hey, did you know that the stoplight is out? Even if you feel like an idiot, even if someone's already done it, do it at that level, but do it for the bigger picture issues in your life as well, and for the bigger picture issues in your community as well. That's what we're talking about here, and it's this diffusion of responsibility is one of the huge, biggest obstacles to, to maintaining and creating engaged communities. So that's my story for you today. That's my argument. That's my claim, is that there's this power of context, and it's incredibly ubiquitous and pervasive in our daily lives, but too infrequently do we actually stop to pay attention to it. And so I would suggest to you that when we do think about the ways in which situations shape our behaviors, when we do take in the full range of, of contextual factors that are in play in any given interaction, we become more engaged members of our community. You have to look past personality. You have to think about the entirety of that situation. And this operates not only at a community level, but individually as well. Right? You'll be a more effective person, whether your to-do list is negotiating uh, a customer service dispute, a raise from your boss, bedtime with your kids, a first date with that cute guy or girl who works out next to you at the gym, and all of those endeavors, as diverse as they are, you're better at them when you start to think about the power of context. And at the very least, you'll know that at the end of the day, the next time you find yourself at one of life's daunting intersections, you're less likely to be the guy who's honking at funerals. Thank you very much.